is George Soros behind the Black Lives Matter movement or the refugee crisis in Europe from a few years ago? What's the relationship between Bill Gates and COVID-19? Or was COVID-19 concocted in a lab in China? What about the 9-11 truther movement? Or if we go back even further, what about the Freemasons? What's the protocols of the elders of Zion? Etc. Etc. Where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves in the wild and crazy and wonderful world of conspiracy theories. So, what would Hayek say? Well, before getting to Hayek, let's start off with the nature of conspiracy theories. I just want to enumerate a few of the, the common threads or themes that pervade conspiracy theories in general. Number one, uh, and most simply and fundamentally, is evil intentions. Right? There's always this sort of presumption that whoever has enacted a conspiracy has some sort of evil or malicious intent. You know, no one ever would ever speak of a conspiracy theory being concocted by someone who actually wants the best for you, for example. You know, that's, that's just not a conspiracy theory. Uh, secondly, is they operate on the, the basis that there's some small, hidden group of people with power, right? So generally, maybe, you know, wealthy people or the government or something like that. Number three is, what's the nature of this power? This power is not just it's empowered not just to influence events, but rather to determine, to control events, on, and often on a very grand global scale, you know? So there's this idea that someone or some small cabal are pulling the strings. The world, and the world is highly receptive, it's highly organized and controllable and highly receptive to, to any of the movements that the small, these small agents do. Uh, a fourth quality about conspiracy theories is they tend to be impossible to disprove. I mean, if, if you say, okay, to a conspiracy theorist, you know, actually, yeah, what you say about X, Y, Z and that sort of thing, that, yeah, that's correct, that there seems to be evidence for that. But let's say you point out, but it seems, you know, on, on ABC, you know, you're a bit murky on the details, or how exactly do you account for that? How are they actually doing it? Oftentimes, the very inability to account for a particular anomaly in the conspiracy theory is proof of the theory itself, you know? It's because, ah, uh, yeah, well, we can't account for that because the really powerful people who are running the show here, they've concealed it from us, you know? That's the whole reason you can't explain it, you know? So it doesn't matter. It, it, they tend to be impossible to disprove. Finally, um, there's a sense that your whole view of reality will change once you understand the forces at work. Okay, so let's come to Hayek here, because Hayek would have a lot to say about some of these points here. And so I'm just going to go through a few of them and, uh, and uh, explain them from Hayek's perspective, what he would say. Let's start with evil intentions, actually, the most basic of them. It must be said that Hayek was one of the most generous intellectual opponents of the 20th century. You couldn't have asked for a better intellectual opponent, frankly, you know? Uh, Schumpeter, his, uh, one of the other great Austrian economists, Joseph Schumpeter, once accused him of politeness to a fault and hardly ever attributing to opponents uh, anything beyond intellectual error. And I think that's a really interesting point, and I'd like to pause on that for just a moment. Hayek's first reaction was not to assume that those who arrived at opposite conclusions had evil intentions, you know? His method is better. His method of never attributing to opponents anything beyond intellectual error was better. And it's not just because it's nice and respectful and fair. It's, it's all of those things, of course. But it's also because it allows you to better understand your opponent's perspective and how to counter it. I mean, opponents, for example, they don't, they don't believe in what it is. Your intellectual opponents don't believe in what they say because it's evil or stupid. I mean... Would you argue in favor of something because it's evil or stupid? Probably not. And so it's probably the case that your opponents are arguing in favor of things because they're evil and stupid either. Finally, Hayek's approach uh, may also be closer to the reality. And what I mean by that is that Hayek's sort of position of, uh, shall we say, epistemological modesty, or just modesty in general, and giving his opponents the benefit of the doubt, helps us guard against the assumption that just because we see unjust things or, or situations in the world, that some unjust people must have intended it. You know, because for Hayek, there's a great gulf between intentions on the one hand and, uh, and outcomes and results on the other. Okay, what about 
the second point that I mentioned, a small hidden group of people with power. I mean, that's, that's all very plausible. There have been small hidden groups of people with power throughout history. But Hayek was a methodological individualist. So what does that mean? It means that when Hayek sees a group, he sees that this group is made up of individuals. And now why is that important? It's important because not all individuals have the exact same preferences. So you could have a small hidden group of people with power, but do they all have the same objectives? Or even agree on the, the means for securing those objectives? Not necessarily. Finally, um, the idea of someone or small, some small group at the top pulling the strings. Well, Hayek would have had many problems with this notion, not least in that he would have uh, considered it analogous to a government's attempt to, to control ever more from the top. And here we would refer to what uh, Hayek knew as, as the knowledge problem. Now, I will ex explicate that in, in another video, but for our purposes, what's most relevant in this context is the unlikelihood that a small, hidden group of people pulling strings behind the scenes uh, des who desire to start a war, for example, or unleash a wave of refugees into Europe, or whatever the case may be, it's unlikely that they could successfully execute this task. And this comes back to the point that I mentioned earlier, namely, our intentions do not always align with the consequences or with the way that events actually end up unfolding, you know, especially when it comes to complex processes. And conspiracy theories have a tendency really to, to account or to purport to account for complex processes. Uh, in one of his texts uh, from 1945 called The Use of Knowledge in Society, Hayek says, if we possess all the relevant information, if we can start out from a given system of preferences, and if we command complete knowledge of available means, the problem which remains is purely one of logic. That's a lot of big ifs. And to those ifs, I would add another big if. If everyone acts as we expect them to, because even if we knew everyone's preferences, we can't assume that everyone acts at all times in accordance with them, either because we're not wholly rational all the time, or because of circumstances, or the unforeseen, or, or whatever the case may be. Okay, I want to conclude with some final thoughts here on, on conspiracy theories. Maybe I've been a little bit harsh on them, because it must be said, there is a certain attractiveness to conspiracy theories, and part of that attractiveness is rooted in some truth. I mean, they are partially plausible. I mean, you have had groups of people who have gotten together throughout history and done evil things. Fair enough. They're attractive for another reason, though. Uh, they're rooted in critique. You know, in, in, which is what enlightened people do. We, we, we all fancy ourselves enlightened people. You know, we're taught to think critically, think rationally about things. And what does that mean? It means going beneath the surface, you know, not just believing everything that you're, you're being told, or everything you read, or God forbid, everything that you find on the internet, you know. It means going a little bit further down into the details, and finding out what's actually, what are the mechanisms that are actually making this, this entire complex you know, thing that we call society or history or whatever actually work. So, and the irony about, about this is that conspiracy theories tell us, or they contest our ability to explain something simply. They tell us not to sit at that superficial level. They tell us to go that, to that deeper level. And yet, at the same, very same time, they themselves oversimplify complex processes. So in I want to bring in, actually, a little bit of, a little bit of help from one of Hayek's great uh, contemporaries, uh, namely Sir Karl Popper. I feel justified in doing this because um, in Conjectures and Reputations by Karl Popper, which was dedicated to Hayek, um, Popper developed the notion of the, um, of the conspiracy theory of society, uh, a sort of uh, what he called a secularization of religious superstitions born of the abandonment of God. Because th then, who's in his place? In God's place. His place is then filled by various powerful men and groups, sinister pressure groups who are to be blamed for having planned the Great Depression and all the evils from which we suffer. Now, on the other hand, there are some theories that some might consider conspiratorial, while others might consider um, them very plausible. 
To give you an example, in 2016, you had the now debunked conspiracy theory uh, called Pizzagate, which was going around. For those of you who don't know or don't remember, Pizzagate was this idea, it happened during the, the election, right, um, in the United States, where some Democratic Party officials were said to be involved in a human trafficking and uh, sex, uh, child sex ring involving a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. Some people believed it, and then it went viral, and then it was disproved, and then it kept going viral, as, as these things, you know, sometimes do. But in any case, what a ridiculous assertion it was in the first place, right? And then fast forward three years to just one year ago, and we had Jeffrey Epstein. So, is there a small, hidden, evil group of people pulling the strings? Maybe. But in all likelihood, and for all of the aforementioned reasons, the situation is probably a lot more complex. And that's what Hayek would say. 